I love Bible prophecy. It shows us how amazing our God is. The only religious book that says, here's what's going to happen in the future so that you can be ready for it. You can keep your eyes open for it. You can study and be approved for it. That stuff's starting to happen today and we're starting to watch a lot of things happen that thousands of years ago were prophesied in this book. The angel told Daniel, hey, the wise will understand, but the wicked will not understand and they'll continue to do wickedly. What does understanding mean? Well, it understands the truth. God tells us, look, I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning so that you know that I'm God. And prophecy is throughout the book. Somewhere between 30 and 33% of the Bible is prophecy. Whether it has already been written and been fulfilled, which gives us the ability to know that God is in the habit of telling us what's going to happen and then fulfilling it. And then there's the other percentage of what's coming that hasn't been fulfilled yet. We can use a prerequisite of looking back at his faithfulness, of answering everything he's ever said was going to happen in stark detail, and then we can look to see that we can count on what's coming next. So as I finish the book of Isaiah, well, I can show you that there is a dichotomy coming. There is a decision for you coming. There is a decision between life and death. Deuteronomy says, I put a, two choices before you, one is living by following my commandments and living for me. The other is, is death in hell because you chose to rebel. Choose life. And Isaiah will bring that, that division, that distinction here in the last two chapters of Isaiah. Now, I've said in the past that Isaiah is known as the mini Bible. The Bible has 66 books in it. It has 26 books in the New Testament 39 books in the Old Testament. And Isaiah is broken down exactly the same way, 66 chapters. And in the first half or the first portion of, of Isaiah's Bible is 39 books that would be, or 39 chapters, much like the 39 books of the Old Testament, talking about God's development, talking about God's drive, his law, what he wants you to do and why you're rebelling against him. But when we get to the second part of Isaiah, the last 26 books that would be indicative of the New Testament, he talks more about a coming Messiah. He prophecies the coming of a destruction. He talks about coming eternity and salvation sent by God, just like the New Testament does. It's really quite amazing. So when you look at 65 and 66, the last two chapters of Isaiah, we see that it's much like Revelation and it tells us what's coming. Now, the Bible, we need to start off by saying that a lot of prophecies in the Bible have dual, uh, dual fulfillments. God will come to you and say, this is going to happen. It happens in the foreground, and it happens again in a bigger way in the future. Some of this is the same, because, Isaiah, because Israel was swept away in judgment, and then was brought back to the land, and then... And then, of course, the same kind of, a dis of judgment is coming again in the future when Jesus returns for his thousand-year reign. But we'll get to that as we go. I want to read to you these two beautiful chapters because it needs to grab you in the heart. It needs to say, holy cow, I have a decision to make. I better do something because 700 years before Jesus... Isaiah is speaking about his coming, about his coming, and then 2,000 plus years past Jesus, which is where we live today, he speaks about things that still have not happened yet. And if you make the right choice, they will be marvelous. If you make the wrong choice, you will miss out on all of it. It's a big choice to make, and I hope this information helps for you to grab it. It's information you haven't heard before. The Bible speaks of things, how it ties into the New Testament, how it ties into salvation, how it ties into the new heavens and the new earth, what Jesus had to say about hell. It's all here. Prophesied 700 years before Jesus was even born. So in Isaiah 65, it says, The Lord says, I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. I was ready to be found, but no one was looking for me. I, I said, here am I, here am I, to a nation that did not call on my name. All day long, I, I opened my arms to a rebellious people, 
but they followed their own evil paths and their crooked schemes. All day long they insult me to my face my work by worshiping idols in sacred gardens. <clears throat> they burn incense on pagan altars. At night they go out among the graves worshiping the dead. They eat the flesh of pigs and make stews with their other forbidden foods. Yet they say to each other, don't come too close, you'll defile me. I'm holier than you. These People are a stench in my nostrils, an acrid smell that never goes away. Just starkly cried away, God says, I was calling to you to help you, to come to you, but you didn't want to hear me. You didn't come to me. You didn't ask for help. I was here. I was trying to get your attention, and you didn't want it. Instead, you, you immediately defiled everything I told you not to do. In your sinfulness and in your flesh, you got to this point where you just... You couldn't, you had to do all this stuff that was just directly against what I told you to do. These people are a stench in my nostrils, an acrid smell that never goes away. God is like, this, this is so disgusting to me that I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to have to do something. Why? Because God is just. And God, although merciful, and he's compassionate, and he gives freely, and he takes care of you like a child, uh, he still has to handle that sinful problem that you have. He sent his son to die for your sins if you accept his son's free gift. But if you don't, then you have to live with it yourself. That judgment, that, that stench of the nostrils of you going about your own rebellion will have to be answered by you. I, I want to make another point here before I move here. It says here, yet they say to each other, don't come too close or you'll defile me. I'm holier than you. Be careful. Be careful of marching around telling people that you're a better person than them. All people have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, and the wage of that sin is death to all people, unless you accept Jesus as your Savior. Verse 6, look, my decree is written out in front of me. I will not stand silent. I will repay them in full. He's saying, look, I, I told them what they needed to do, and they didn't do it. And I will, I, I'm not going to be tolerant about what's coming. I'm going to pay out in full what is earned. Interestingly, Romans tells us that the wage of sin is death. You earn the wage of sin. Just like you earn a wage at a job. The wage of your rebellion against God is something you've earned. You've earned death. He doesn't give you death. You earned it. Now, death can be wiped out by the blood of Jesus Christ if you accept him. But you have to accept, repent from your sins, and turn away. But I want you to know that if you did that, you're going to see what that means in eternity here in a little while you're also going to see that if you choose to continue like here when he's really angry at these people for doing all this stuff that's against his law, how bad that can be. That, that decision is laid up in both of these chapters in a beautiful way. <clears throat> I will pay them back in full. Verse 8, but I will not destroy them all, says the Lord. For just as good grapes are found among the clusters of bad ones, and someone will say, don't throw them all away. Some of those grapes are good. So I will not destroy all of Israel, for I still have true servants there. I will preserve a remnant of the people of Israel. A remnant is a small population. So he'll preserve a group of people in Israel. But if you read through Revelation, you're going to find out that two-thirds of the population of Israel are going to be wiped out. They're going to be murdered by the Antichrist. But he's going to save a third. Those people are going to be saved so that Israel doesn't wipe out for good. We know that throughout the Bible, the devil has been trying to destroy the people of Israel, trying to wipe them off the map through through a, a number of places where you've seen anti-Semitism, even up to today. Uh, Hitler killing all the all the Jews, Egypt trying to kill them all. Haman in the book of Ruth, uh, in the book of Esther, trying to kill all the Jews. Satan has been trying to kill the Israelites for generations. Why? Because if he can he can kill the people of God, then Jesus has no people to come back to. And then that would make Jesus and God a liar. That's been his aim. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. God is going to save a remnant, a small population of his people, so that they will not be extinct. But, but you got to be ready for that. That's coming in the, in, in the second half of the tribulation. 
I will preserve a remnant of the people of Israel and of Judah to possess my land. Those I choose will inherit it and my servants will live there. The plain of Sharon will again be filled with flocks for my people who have searched for me and the valley of Accor will be a place for pasture and herds. He's talking about the fact that that you're going, that my people are going to be taken out of the land and the land's going to live desolate, but I'm going to allow them to return and repopulate the land. That's a tremendous prophecy we see in Ezekiel 37. We're going to talk about it here in a little bit. Something that is very, very specific and important to understand, but is better illustrated here in a little while. Verse 11. But because the rest of you forsaken the Lord and have forgotten his temple, and because you have prepared feasts to honor the God of fate and have offered mixed wine of the God of destiny, those are not gods, right? They're fate and destiny. Well, now I will destine you for a sword. <laughs> destiny is the will of God. It's not just your destiny by some spiritual God is in control of everything. And so he's saying, look, because you leaned on destiny, you're destined to be destroyed. All of you will bow down before the executioner. For when I called, you did not answer. And when I spoke, you did not listen. You deliberately sinned before my very eyes and chose to do what you know I despise. There's one thing to say. You either, if you don't know, then you could play the game that, I, look, I didn't know that that was wrong. And your punishment from God will be less. But because the Bible tells us what's wrong, if you deliberately do what is wrong, and we're living in a nation right now that's tolerating a lot of tremendously wrong stuff, very clearly here, when we talk about the definition of marriage, the definition of gender, uh, uh, abortion and child sacrifice, which was abortion in the Old Testament. We see that these things really get the, the ire, really get the anger of God fired up. And, and our nation is under judgment, I believe, because we we're allowing to tolerate these things. We're even, our leaders are even making laws that make it even easier to, to do this. And so when you deliberately sin before the eyes of God and you chose to do what you know I despise, because of that, judgment is coming and I will destine you for the sword. Therefore, verse 13, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My servants will eat, but you will starve. My servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be sad and ashamed. My servant will sing for joy, but you will cry in sorrow and despair. There's the decision. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've accepted him as your savior, you've repented and turned away from your sinful behaviors, your habitual sins to seek after God, you will be known as a servant. You will be known as God's servant, a doulos, uh, as it is in the Greek, in the, in the New Testament, someone who has given all of their life to follow and serve Jesus. But by doing so, you will be adopted into the family of God and be a co-heir with Christ for eternity. What he's saying here is if you're a servant, you will eat and drink and you will rejoice and sing for joy. But if you choose to rebel against God and do your own thing, be your own God, as Adam and Eve found out really quickly, well, you will starve and you will be thirsty and you will be sad and ashamed and you will live in sorrow and despair. That's, that's the choice. Live for God or live for yourself. That's your choice. Verse 14, uh, verse 15, your name will be curse word among my people for the sovereign Lord will destroy you and will call his true, his true servants by another name. The, the revelation tells us that when we are seen by Jesus, he will write our name on a white stone. It is a pass into a wedding feast, into eternity. That stone will have a name you don't know, only he knows. He will reveal it to you in time. But he will change the names of other of, of, of those who are on earth as we change, uh, as the Bible tells us, we change our residency. Once you re, once you're filled with the Spirit and changed, you are now not a resident of earth. You're a resident of heaven, and now you're just a a vagabond. Quite frankly, you're a sojourner on earth. You're just staying here, intense, waiting to be called back home. Now you're an ambassador of God, the King Jesus in heaven, of which is your kingdom. And doing so, do you have to, what happens when you, when a king gives you an order? You have to follow it because it's the king. 
and he's given us his orders here, but he's a benevolent and brilliant and and loving and merciful and powerful king, one that want, you want to serve, the one that you really want to serve. Verse 17, look, I'm creating a new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. Be glad, rejoice forever in my creation, and look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy, and I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight in my people. And the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Now he's talking about when earth is destroyed and uh, a new heavens and a new earth is created. We read about that in Revelation chapter 21. The apostle John is speaking as God as he has seen this vision in heaven. Look what it says, verse chapter 21, verse 1. Then, this is John speaking, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was, all, was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout for the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. No more to be split from God by, by, the, by the first heavens, which is the atmosphere, the second heavens, which is the celestial um, space, and the third spirit heaven no more to be to be divided between us on earth and him in heaven but he will dwell with us much like we read in the book of revelation uh, the book of genesis when they're in the uh, garden of eden god himself will be with them he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain all these things are gone forever in isaiah about 750, 760 years after Isaiah writes this down, John writes the same thing in the book of Revelation. You see the difference. The end of Isaiah and the end of the New Testament of Revelation, they coincide with each other. So brilliant. There's no way that God, you couldn't make this all up. God is in the details. Verse 20, no longer will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at 100. Only the cursed will die that young. And in those days, people will live in the houses they built and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. And unlike the past, invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards. For my people will live as long as trees. And my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune, for they are people blessed by the Lord, and their children too will be blessed. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat hay like a cow, but the snakes will eat dust. And in those days, no one will be hurt or destroyed on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, this section is talking about the thousand-year millennial reign. After the, th after the rapture of the church and after the seven-year tribulation, Jesus will come back to world, back to the earth, with his church. And he will judge the building, he will judge the earth, and he will knock out all of sin, and Satan will be destroyed, and death will be destroyed, and Hades will be destroyed, all that stuff there. And then he will take a 45-day period of time to renew the world. The earth will be renewed to Edenic levels. It is believed that we will be back to a perfect world. We know that Romans tells us this. Check this out. This is so cool. Romans chapter 1, if I can find it um, quickly, Romans chapter 8. It's Romans chapter 8 that tells us this. He's one of the greatest, um, one of the coolest chapters in all of, uh, all of the earth and all of the Bible tells us Yet, this is verse 18, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation, see, listen to this, all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. 
Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So cool that even the tree that died in my yard and the tree across the street that has lost all its that, that decay and difficult and hardship and, and climate and all of this stuff will be gone. And it will be remade perfect and renewed. That creation is waiting for those who have accepted Christ to be renewed and be brought back to earth so that it can be regenerated and death and decay won't happen to happen to it either. And then animals won't eat animals. It says here, it says the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. We know that that was the same in Eden, that all animals ate fruits and vegetables and grains because only after the flood that God told Noah that animals needed to eat other animals. That, that that was something that had to come because of the flood, because of the judgment, because of all that stuff. Because as animals and people decayed, they needed the protein, they needed the building blocks because that was the way that, that he was going to regulate the world. But it's going to go back to normal, back to Eden, back to these kinds of things. How cool is that? That happens at the end of the seven-year tribulation. So we move into the last chapter of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 1 says, This is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Could you build me such a resting place? My hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. They're back to that thought process, Genesis 1.1. Do you believe that God made the heavens and the earth, or do you not? That's the decision. If you believe that God made heaven and the earth, and you would believe that everything else can be done by God too because he's sovereign and has the power, and therefore he would have sent his son because of his deal to save you from your sin and eternity in heaven are real because he can make that. If he can do this, he can do that. Believe in it, or do you not? Do you fall under this secular humanism idea where evolution just continues, that all of this is a mistake and it all just kind of happenstance through billions of years of evolution, which is a complete lie? You, what, you, you have to understand that by doing that, by taking that stand, you see yourself too small. You don't give yourself enough credit for who the wonderful God has made you to be a certain particular person, to have certain particular um, abilities and, and talents to use in the kingdom of God so that you can love and, and enjoy life that it, you just evolution is very very short-sighted and, and you fail to see the majesty of what God really made you to be heaven is my throne look at number two my hands have made a heavens and the earth there it is I am the creator of the heavens and the earth God is stating through Isaiah thousands of years later that he's the creator I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts, who tremble at my words. Those who believe in me, who fear me and with a reverent uh, fear, with a respect that knows that I can do all things and that I created you. And because of that, you would be led to do what I've told you to do, to follow my word. I will love you and I will give you all things. Much like a, much like a child follows his father's rules. It, we, we give our children rules and we punish them when they break them not because we hate them, but because we love them and we need to lead them along and lead them in a way that they're respectful of other people, respectful for their elders. They don't get into trouble. They don't do silly stuff. They don't end up in jail. That, that's the whole point. He is our father in heaven and, he's, and he wants us to be good children and he gives us opportunity to obey and he punishes us when we don't, just like a good father. Verse three, but those who choose their own way, delighting in their detestable sins, will not have their offerings accepted. When such people sacrifice a bull and a no acceptable, it's no more acceptable than a human sacrifice. And when they sacrifice a lamb, it's as though they had sacrificed a dog. And when they bring an offering of grain, they might as well have offered the blood of pig. 
When they burn frankincense, it's as if they blessed an idol. I will send them great trouble and all, the, and all things they feared. For when I called, they did not answer. And when I spoke, they did not listen. He's basically saying, he's making a statement about false worship. He's saying, if you don't follow my lead, if you don't accept Jesus, if you don't believe in me, then the good things that you think that you're doing for people are as if they're not. I don't see him that way, right? Because everybody's a sinner. And it's not about what you do. It's about who you know. It's about who you accept. Because God doesn't need you to do anything for him. He can do it for himself. He just wants you to be in a relationship with him. He, he wants you to choose to love him. Because true love, the choice to love him or not love him, is true love. Because you can't love something, you can't force to be loved something. I can't make you love God. I can only ex I can only offer you the, t the, the information. You need to choose to love God. And he's given you that choice because true love is, is only, can only be acceptable by knowing that the, the, but by walking away is the other choice. You can choose to love or choose to hate. That choice is yours. God wants you to choose to love him. And he will bless you beyond compare. But if you don't choose him and you don't revere him, then anything you do that you think is good, anything you do for him, anything you do for other people, eh, they're not worth it. That's what he was saying there. <clears throat> Verse 5. Hear this message from the Lord, all you tremble at his words. Your own people hate you and throw you out for being loyal to my name. Let the Lord be honored, they scoff. Be joyful in him, but... They will be put to shame. Uh, what is all the commotion in the city? Well, what is the terrible noise from the temple? It is the voice of the Lord taking vengeance against his enemies. Before the birth pangs even begin, Jerusalem gives birth to a son. Who has, e who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who had ever searched or heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Whoever uh, has a country ever come forth in a mere moment. But by the time Jerusalem's birth pains begin, their child will be born. Would I ever bring this nation to the point of birth and then not deliver it? Asks the Lord. No, I would never keep this nation from being born, says your God. Now, interestingly, this is the most important prophecy in the Bible. Because no matter what you read, what you believed, what all these people before 1948 thought and saw, nothing meant anything until Jerusalem became a nation again. We see that he says, can I be a, bring a nation, can a nation be born in a single day? Well, guess what? We also read about that in Ezekiel 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones. He says, can these people live again? Can these bones live again? Now, up until this point, Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, is speaking of the fact that Israel will cease to be a nation at some point. Now, we know that day came in 70 AD when Rome came in, destroyed the temple, and it did something. It became the diaspora, the great dispersion. And Israel was spread out all over the world. The Bible says, I'm going to disperse you away from the promised land that I promised you because of your sins. But I will bring you back. Now, nobody knew where that was. Nobody knew when that was going to happen. Nobody knew. But here he is saying, can a nation be born in a single day? Guess what? It can. Because May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation in one day. And after 2,000 years of being somewhere spread out all over the world, for the first time and the only time in history, a nation came back with its nation, with its language, with its customs and religions. All of it came back and became a nation again. And that is amazing. But strangely, before that happens, nothing can be no, nothing can have happened. You know, we, we talk about the idea that, oh, things have been this way all the time. We, Peter says, you know, 
scoffers will say, where is the promise of his coming? That's Jesus' coming. Because all these things since the beginning of time have gone about the same way. And I, he has said he was going to come. He says there's rumors of wars. He says there's pestilences. He says that lawlessness will abound, that violence will increase, that all these things will happen that means and points to the idea that Jesus is coming back. But this has never happened before, and we've never seen it happen since, and so why would we believe it? But check this out. In an interesting uh, twist, back in back in nineteen uh, back in eighteen sixty seven, Mark Twain took a trip to Israel, and he wrote in a journal about what he saw. And I want to read to you two points that he wrote in this in his um, in, in his journal about Israel. 1864. It says Twain was fed up with the pre with the primitiveness of the settlements and roads he encountered. Quote, the further we went, the hotter the sun got, and the more rocky and bare, repulsive and dreary the landscape became. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. The statement reflects this general attitude to the ancient land throughout the journey. And then at the end, it says, he makes another statement. Now, he, he refers to it as Palestine because before Israel was a nation again, it was known as Palestine. This is Twain states that, quote, Palestine is desolate and unlovely. And why should it be otherwise? Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? Palestine is no more of this workday world. It's sacred to poetry and tradition. It's a dreamland. Here's Mark Twain, who's writing in a journal about the desolation of Israel, that no people, no vegetation, nothing is out there. But in, in Ezekiel 36 and 37, God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring back water, bring back vegetation, bring back all these people, and I'm going to bring back my nation, and that nation is going to stay in that land forever, and then things are going to start, and it happens. May 14th, 1948, they signed to be a nation again, and they have come under great scrutiny. They have been attacked countless times. The anti-Semitism continues because Satan wants to destroy God's people. And right now, they're the eighth most strongest econ economy in the world. They're exporting more, uh, so much fruits and vegetables and livestock and grain and all this other stuff because the, because the land has been brought back to life by God. Now, this is important because that was the start of the time stamp. Because all these things that have been happening all the way through time could not mean prophetically anything until G the Jews were back in the land. And now they are. So now we're starting to watch the prophetic timeline start. So the things that say that are coming in the end now can be fulfilled because the Jews are back in the land. That is an amazing, amazing prophecy written here 700 years before Jesus. And gosh... How, how amazing the word of God is. Verse 10, rejoice with Jerusalem, be glad with her, all who love her and all who mourn for her. Drink deeply of her glory, even as an, in, an infant drinks at his mother's comforting breast. Psalm, Psalm 122 verse 6 says, pray for the safety of Israel. It is God's people and you're watching anti-Semitism continuing to increase. Satan wants to destroy Israel. The, Iran wants to destroy Israel. Why? Because Satan doesn't need, doesn't want the people of God here when Jesus returns. Verse 12, <clears throat> this is what the Lord says. I will give Jerusalem a river of peace and prosperity. The wealth of the nations will flow to her. Her children will be nursed at her breasts, carried in her arms and held on her lap. I will comfort you there in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her children. And when you see these things, your heart will rejoice. You will flourish like the grass. Everyone will see the Lord's hand of blessing on its servants and his anger against his enemies. See, the Lord is coming with fire and his swift chariots roar like a whirlwind. He will bring punishment with the fury of his anger and the flaming fire of his hot rebuke. The Lord will punish the world by fire and by his sword. He will judge the earth and many will be killed by him. He's talking about the seven year tribulation. 
Verse 17, those who consecrate and purify themselves in a sacred garden with its idol in the center, feasting on pork and rats and other detestable meats, will come to a terrible end. Those who are in idolatry and rebellion against God will come to a terrible end, says the Lord. I can see what they're doing and I know what they're thinking. So I will gather all nations and peoples together and they will see my glory. I will perform a sign among them and I will send them those to survive, to be messengers to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians who are famous as archers, to Tubal and Greece and to all the lands before the sea that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will be, they will declare my glory to the nations and they will bring the remnant of your people back from every nation. They will bring them to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord. And they will ride on horses and chariots and wagons and on mules and camels says the Lord. And I will appoint some of them to be my priests and Levites. The Lord has spoken still more, um, working on getting the word out and bringing his Jews and bringing Christians and bringing believers and bringing God's people back to a specific certain land in Jerusalem. Verse 22, as surely as my new heavens and earth will remain, so will you always be my people. That's a promise with a name that will never disappear. That's a promise. We're talking about eternity. My, uh, the, as long as the, as surely, surely not as long as, but as surely as my heavens and earth will remain, that is an eternal statement. So will always be, you will always be my people, always meaning eternal with a name that will never disappear. It will never disappear. It will always be there eternal as well. Promises by God. All humanity will come to worship me from week to week and from month to month. And as they go out, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. For the worms that devour them will never die. And the fire that burns them will never go out. All who pass by will view them with utter horror. Now, what are we talking about here when it says the worm that devours will never die and the fire that burns will never go out? Well, we know that he's talking about hell. Why? Because Jesus uses the exact same words to describe hell in Mark chapter 9. Look at what it says. Uh <clears throat> Chapter 9, verse 42, this is Jesus speaking. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life and only one hand than to go into unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one foot than to be thrown into hell with two feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. The Bible is cool because between the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jesus quotes almost all the prophets and most of the books of the Old Testament, which is why they are in the canon. Because Jesus believed in the books of the Bible because he was the author of the, of the writings. In a spiritual sense, not in a physical Jesus sense, but the word of God, Jesus is known as the word in John chapter 1. Jesus was the one who administered the Old Testament, who administered through the Holy Spirit the Word of God. They are all brought in by God, inspired through men to write them down. And because of that, they are perfect and infallible. So realize when Jesus uses terms in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, when God uses Old Testament terms and Jesus uses New Testament terms, they commingle and they tell us why we know what's being talked about. That's what's brilliant about this. And so when Isaiah talks about, as God is speaking about maggots that don't die and fire that doesn't go out, and Jesus says, this is going on in hell, then we can, co we can bring them back together and understand God's word. That's the beauty of it. The best, the best way to justify something said in the word of God is to find other places in the word of God that justifies itself. It, it justifies itself. It is brilliant. So that ends the book of Isaiah.
You have one of two choices. Choose to believe that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, accept everything that's written in this Bible, and accept Jesus as your Savior so that you can then go live in those wonderful places. And we're talking about renewed earth, an earth that has no death or disease, where animals live together and there is no blood and it, it's not decrepit anymore because because everything was renewed, and then into the coming down the new Jerusalem, the bride of God, to live with God forever in eternity? Or don't believe it, and don't accept it, and let Satan blow it off in your mind to pull the veil over your face so you can't see the truth. The very truth is very clearly written out here. The Bible has been proven True time, time, and time, and time, and time again. And that's a prerequisite to know that the, that the future of the Bible will be true as well. And that's, that leads you with a decision. In De Deuteronomy, it says, like I said, I, I place before you two decisions. I, I, you have a decision to make. <laughs> Death or life, right? Choose life by choosing to accept Christ as your one and only Savior. Have a great day and be blessed.